Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Trafford from ACO, and a very warm welcome to our first live webinar of 2021, The Smarter Way to Compliance. During the next few hours, all the sessions will revolve solely around the day-to-day -day challenges of achieving compliance and how technology can support you now and in the future. The first session today, The Importance of Compliance, will be chaired by Debbie Lana, Head of Practice at CIH. Debbie will be joined by Eddie Spicer from Orwell Housing and Dave Metcalf from 13 Group. This will be followed by a case study by Peter Chapman from Barnett Homes. After a short 10 minute break, Michael Wright, ACO's Product Development Manager, will run through a session on how technology can support you, including a live demonstration of the SmartLink Gateway. This will be followed by the final session of the afternoon, a panel discussion around the challenges of compliance. This will be chaired by Andy Speak, ACO's National Technical Manager. Andy will be joined by Ricky Lang from Decorum Borough Council, Gavin Bass from Barnett Homes, Mark Crawdon from the London Borough of Harrow, and Alistair Weir from Charing Cross Housing Association. As always, many thanks for taking the time to join us at your busy days. Um, please put the questions through the chat box. We will answer as many as we can as the afternoon goes on. Um, and, and that leaves nothing else to say but to welcome Debbie to take over. Thank you so much for joining this event. We've got a lot of you here today, so hopefully we've got some good questions. Um, as I said, my name is Debbie Lana, and I'm Head of Practice at CIH. Um, I am really honoured to be able to chair this session. We've only got half an hour, so we need to be quite kind of quick. I know Dave's there, um, but I think um, I think Eddie's got lost somewhere. And I don't know if anyone can find me, Eddie. So while while we're trying to find Eddie, I'll just introduce both David and Eddie and tell you a little bit about them. Um, David Metcalf works for Thirteen Group, and he started off as an electrical services manager. Um, Dave started as an electrician, engineer, apprentice um, 30 years ago, so huge amounts of experience in this area. So we're really excited to hear what, what David's got to say. Um, and we'll, hopefully we'll find... Oh, and apologies, yes, my, my camera's not working and that's why you can't see me. It was working brilliantly until five minutes beforehand, but as is the thing with these things. So Eddie, when we find him, um, Eddie describes himself as on the wrong side of 50. I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, I don't think there is a wrong side of 50. I think 50 is great. Um, he also started out as an engineer, um, as an electrician. And then he's moved through the ranks to, to take on a broader compliance role. And at the moment, he's um, working for the last two years. He's worked for Allwell Housing um, as head of compliance and planned work. So again, a huge breadth of experience. So I think I was going to start with Eddie, but I'm going to start with Dave. Um, Dave, do you want to kind of come along and say a few words, introduce yourself? Hi there. Yeah, I think you've probably just summed myself up. Yeah, um, <laughs> 30, 30 years um, working within the compliance sector, starting off as a, an electrical engineer at the time. And uh, obviously, roles have developed and changes to legislation and guidance have probably guided organisations that I've worked with within the local housing sector and social housing um, from different roles to m and &E managers to compliance managers down, down to different things. But yeah, that's that's a general overview of myself. Um, so as we know, compliance is, is a hugely important area in housing and one of, probably would say one of the most challenging areas to work for in, within the housing sector. So what do you reckon day to day are the biggest challenges and, and do you think those, those have changed over the last couple of years? I would say definitely massively changed, um, especially I would probably specifically say in the last 15 years. years. Um, I would currently say um, we're in that um, area of change at the moment, obviously due to the ongoing things that are going on. Uh, in terms of current information distributed by the regulator around building safety, and what that means to an organisation like ourselves. Um, obviously, the new addition of the Building Safety Regulator will provide a little bit more clarity around expectations uh, and def hopefully define some of the responsibilities and give us a little bit more clarity um, about what their requirements are as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. And do you think, um, do you think, what do you think about the new um, building safety regular? Do you think it's going to add that level of assurance to, to the compliance role? I do. I, I think it is. I think it's a step in the right direction um, for an organisation organization like ourselves. We always try to be in front of the curve. So it's trying to interpret. You're looking at some of the, the things that are out for consultation at the moment. Some of the requirements around even my area around electrical safety, smoke detection and just trying to be ahead of the curve. So it's not a massive shock to an organisation like ourselves. So having somebody who's from a building safety perspective that then feeds down, because I know they did a um, consultation paper around fire safety, mm -hmm. and I've always felt there's been a little bit of ambiguity between certain specific areas of compliance. So hopefully it'll streamline and we'll get a bit of a, as they say, the thread, we'll follow that thread through and give us a little bit more um, reassurance that what we're doing is correct. Yeah, and I guess um, one of the challenges with the new regulation around building safety is that the regulator is only looking at um, fire safety, structural safety. How are you going to link in all the compliance areas to make sure that you've got a holistic view? Yeah, um, for an organisation like ourselves, we've we've uh, got a new building safety manager and um, so it's very much going to feed through there that still sits within the compliance area um, I think it's about working together and understanding what we're trying to achieve as an organization especially and um, for an organization like us and um, we have many multiple uh, tenures within our um, especially our high risk buildings which we would call high risk so whether they're um, high rise buildings or whether they're um, schemes or whatever with multiple different people within there i think you would have to get everybody in and around the table and hopefully this new regulator that's going to be started will give us some like i say it'll give us some clarity around that and uh, be able to provide some guidance and hopefully legislation um i think that's always been one of the things in within specific areas of compliance that we haven't had enough statutory requirements and everything's been left open a little bit to interpretation yeah, interesting that you've um, actually already recruited a building safety manager. I think that's really positive that you're not sitting around waiting to be told and you're cracking on like that and you'll, you'll flex the post according to what it needs best. Um, everyone who's joined the event, please feel free to, to post your questions and I'll I'll post those pass those up to David. I guess the other sort of broader cool question, question about compliance is is there so much to it? It's so complex. Um, how do you prioritise in terms of across all the array of work streams? How do you prioritise, or, or is that not a question you have to just deal with all, all of them, no matter what? Yeah, we 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 try not to prioritise. Um, we we feel that everything that sits under the compliance banner, as such, has its own priority. Um, obviously, as a as we're governed by the regulators in respect of what we are to do as an organisation and and what our challenges are and how we report on that. Essentially, all the compliance activities um, for an organisation like ourselves um, are given the same importance. And I think um, from an organisational point of view, that importance gives a little bit more reassurance to the customer also that we're taking all the activities at the same level. Yeah, absolutely. I guess it's one of those things. And I guess a huge part of the, the whole compliance agenda is about keeping residents safe and not only keeping them safe, making them feel that, that, that they're safe as well. So there's a difference between perception and reality. So, so what's the kind of how do you as an organisation interact with your residents so that they understand their responsibilities on compliance, but also to give them that assurance they need. Do, do you know, we're having these same conversations in, within our own organisation. I think this in customer engagement um, is, is paying a, making a massive impact on, on a business like ourselves and um, how, how we achieve that. I know with, we've tried trial different things using digital things within, it's safer in high rise, um, getting to the customer a bit quicker so it'll have compliance, within a building or a high rise we have a, a digital system 
that's on the ground floor that tells everybody about when the next checks are due or whatever down down to that granular level but then also just giving them the ability to be able to make their own decisions as well and i know that the um obviously the white paper was a lot about um some of how we would engage to make make the customer um feel more in, involved but also give them a little bit more assurance that an organization like ourselves was providing that building safety yeah absolutely i think that's going to be really really important and i guess uh, compliance is, is is a real fundamental stream in ensuring that that, that your lenders um are confident in your buildings and the, the whole building safety i guess across the whole compliance is really impactful certainly we've talked about cladding and um the assurance from lenders there it's, do you know in we we were also talking about this only the other week we've um, obviously we've removed cladding and replaced as such and then there's been other buildings where we haven't replaced the cladding because we've had the ability not to do so um but yes um we've tried to get it like i always say we tried to get ahead of the curve um, we do we put another factors in there to support those buildings if they have got cladding so such as sprinkler systems and um, trying to use some of the new technologies as such um, to just support that really and ensure our lenders know that as an organisation we're doing everything that's reasonable and practicable so it's within our financial realms and um, also provides the building safety for the regulator. Yeah, that's great. Oh, I just spent, at this moment I'd just like to introduce um, Tina, Tina Mystery, which I'm sure most of you have already met Tina. Um, Tina is our is relationship manager for ACO and she's in the virtual world out there somewhere so tina do you want to join us ah brilliant hello tina great to see you i also noticed in the you mentioned the white paper david and it talks also about um it picks up issues around um carbon monoxide smoke alarms making them mandatory and it also picks up the electrical safety as well um what can i just ask for your thoughts on that yeah, so um, in relation to the carbon monoxide and the smoke detection, um, I think we're a little bit behind the game as a country. Um, I think that obviously other areas of the UK have, have made strides in their areas. I know that it'll have a massive financial impact on what we do as organisations. Um, but we probably look got a, we're looking at it from the, the wrong way, I think it's obviously with this new building regulator i'm hoping they'll impose something and um, it's a bit of a stern hand on the statutory requirements to provide for those buildings in terms of smoke detection and carbon monoxide carbon monoxide um, detectors also going on to the, the realms of electrical safety and condition reports or whatever you want to call them for um, individual properties um, I'm a massive advocate of that um, I know there was a there was a bill took to Parliament last a uh, couple of years ago um, for the electrotechnical guide to where uh, the five-year electrical testing and about access and and giving it those stamp of authority and um, to give us a bit more um, accessibility to gain access to those properties because I know that the, obviously the gas um, looking after the gas uh, a couple of years ago as such and um, they they have mass mass problems with gaining access to carry out their legislative requirements but then when force as the regulator does for us to carry out electrical safety inspections without the back of a legislation or a statutory requirement then it can become quite difficult that's a really interesting point isn't it david i think the fact that electrical compliance when you look at gas safety you were to take enforcement action you can actually get a conjunction against a, a resident to get access, but in electrical, you can't. Yeah. It's quite no. bizarre considering the importance of where, where we are in the current climate of everyone being at home, uh, especially around people being at home and overloaded plugs, etc. The high, the more of a high risk electrical. I think it's, it's a bit when we talk about when we talk about regulator compliance and electrical, it'd be really good to see that aspect of enforcement potentially as well. What do you think to that? Yeah, um, it, the, I think it's it's a long time coming. Um, I think it's been high on the agenda. Um, obviously, we've seen a step forward within the private rented sector, um, where they then fall. It, it's now legislation for them to be be carrying those out. 
I've seen papers coming out from the regulator now around um, leaseholders, which has is, is added another strain onto the compliance team within our maybe our high risk areas where the expectation is that we enforce the um, the, the fact that we pro are provided with the electrical safety inspections for leaseholders as such. So there's loads of different things that are coming in that are just making things a little bit more contentious. But if you had a different legislation for two specific areas, as in the rented and the private rented, I think they probably need to harmonise those things just to give a bit of clarity to people. Great, thanks, David. There's, there's lots of questions coming in about um, technology, as you would hope for in this day and age. So how do you think technology can aid or support the compliance role? Yeah, um, we, we, we're one as many things as possible we're, cu we're currently um, trialing some of the gateways and from um, obviously ACO at the moment and obviously but a long-standing relationship with ACO in the sense of our our uh, and our our residents uh, we have a lot of the different technologies that are provided um, the, the best thing about the new technologies is stuff it, it's real-time information at a real time that we could then pass on quite easily back to our customers and like I said earlier on about the white paper, it was about creating that engagement and making those customers feel safe in their own home. And the only way we could do that is using the abilities of new technology so much to uh, pass on that information at real time. And well, that's an interesting aspect again, isn't it? I think how you use technology to actually influence resident behaviour. I think you can meet the regulatory compliance, what you do in fire, gas and electrical, but but the other aspect is, is residents also taking that sense of ownership over their own pride or their own safety. Uh, it, when you use technology, it's really interesting how you can actually get empower residents to be involved, which answers quite a lot of the consumer engagement white paper that's out there. I don't know, it's, it's, it's an interesting area of technology and engaging residents in different ways, isn't there? Yeah, and it's, it's understanding your residents at the moment. And we talked about engagement earlier on, and it's knowing what they want as a customer now, because um, they're not just a resident, they're a, they're a customer, they're buying into living within our properties at the moment. So I know that the paper talked a lot about how we engage and what do they want? What do they want to see? What do they want to make? What do they want to see to make them see, feel safer in their home? And us as an organisation, I think we've bought into that a little bit more um, than we probably have at the past, but I think we've just needed that direction from some of the information that's been sent out at the moment to give us that extra push, even though we've always engaged, but we haven't engaged to the levels that we are at the moment and make them feel safer within their own homes. I think it's the fact that you've got private, if you're talking about in terms of the private rental area and, and actually where you where you've got different segments of residents, haven't you? I think it's just about how compliance becomes a bit more complicated because yeah. not only are you dealing with your customer base as you currently do in terms of your social rental, uh, but then you've also got the private rental aspect that comes into it because you're letting properties out and sometimes managing properties on behalf of other organisations. So there's a whole complexity in terms of engagement as well, isn't there? And there is, and I'm hoping that at some point in time we can offer those technologies to those leaseholders, to those subletters, to those people that will probably that will hopefully encompass the whole buildings or or residents or however we see to distribute it. It, it. It's very open at the moment. Obviously, there's lots of technologies that we can use. There's such, but there's a lot of information that we need to be passed out and that needs to be looked through at the moment before we make any mass changes what we do as an organisation. David, there's, there seems to be a lot of a lot of feedback on the on the on the side panel about the challenges around access, especially now, and even more so maybe in this what we're in third lockdown. And it's something we're hearing a lot about um, you know, either challenges around operatives not wanting to go is a challenge about people not letting you in. Um, is that something you're experiencing at 13? Yeah, uh, yes. I'm smirking because it's a huge <laughs> challenge. I, I think the challenge was big enough as before the pandemic, um, but it's just absolutely just gone catastrophic with, with what's gone on. And it's totally understandable. Um, us as an organisation um, is still providing those electrical safety inspections what during the pandemic because we see them as 
as part of the regulatory requirements. Um, we, we're offering, obviously, the, the guys go in PPE as such, but we do get a lot of res restrictions from the customers in the sense of they, they, they feel uncomfortable as with us entering the building. It's just been enhanced a little bit more with a lot of the kids work uh, doing school work from home. Yeah. So you can hardly go in and turn the electric off for half the day when obviously you've got young children who are, who are learning using the Wi-Fi as such. So there's a lot of hampering us being able to conduct what we're supposed to be doing. But yes, the in relation to the access issues, they were, they were here long before the pandemic. I mean, in our organisation, we, we very much looked at we digitalise the organisation in the sense of how we deliver things. So everything's digitalised from the access. So we have a no access point of view from the same as gas safety. So it's a replication of that. So it goes through a legal process from compliance point of view. We've shown we've offered the appointments and we've shown we've offered the accesses and we've done all the things reasonable and practicable as an organisation. If we still refuse access, then there's not many places we can go as a department, whereas the gas can, it can use that enforcement side of things. Yeah, Tina, do you have any thoughts on that? Sorry again, sorry, sorry again, Debbie. Sorry, Tina, do you have anything to add to that? I think the access, I think you're right. I think access has always been an issue. I remember when I was back in social housing, the same issue was access, but I think it, and it, it, there's a whole thing about residents don't want to let you in, but is it is it a case of, no one's engageable. You've got to find a way of engaging with those residents somehow. Of your other. We've, we've, we've offered prize draws. Um, we've, we've done everything that most organisations, people will be on here. Um, and it's very much been doing it for years and years and years. We offer prize draws for letting us in on first access. Um, so it's, there's a many a different thing that we try. We, we've done everything. But I think without those legislation to sit behind us from a from an electrical safety point of view, um, I think we're always going to find it a little bit harder than other areas of compliance. I think I agree with you. I think you see we work with quite a lot of local authority housing associations, and I think it is the, the I think that is a sticky point that does need to be addressed somehow, doesn't it? But it's how do we as a sector address that together? Well, it, it, it came up, didn't it, in the. Sorry, Debbie. Um, I think it came up in the paper, wasn't it? It was going out for consultation to see what people thought as, as social housing landlords. And I hope the people who reply back and, and gives, because unless we do it as a mass, I don't think that anybody will probably take this on board as such. And I know that obviously um, there's certain groups um, who, who are looking at it at the moment, who are still billing in, lobbying government in certain aspects to be able to get this pushed through. But like I say, unless we do it as a mass and, and all get together and, uh, and, and ensure that we can get this as a legislation. Well, I've got the answer to this. We all need to move to the Isle of, White, Isle of Man. Because <laughs> I think the point that the is all slightly different there. Let's all move there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it's broader than that. It's you owe a duty of care to your residents, but you also owe a duty of care to your operatives and people carrying out the work. And it's that balance, isn't it? it it's just very, very hard. Do you use someone, someone pointed out that they use that use the tenancy conditions that around gaining access, but that's not always an easy process, is it? No. Um there there is legislation within uh, tenancy enforcement um that you could probably use, but it's getting it's getting that level as an organization and it's getting the buy-in. We have solicitors that look within our own organization looking from a legal perspective this at this on on daily accounts. If, if I could give one example, fit and sprinkler systems within high-rise buildings and somebody doesn't want to give us access to fit a sprinkler within their property. Um, just just for the general condition of not wanting to let us in and how that affects the whole building. And, and we've looked at the legalities around how we can gain access to provide that to provide that safety measure to the building. Now, I don't understand why, why nobody wanted as such, but obviously it's probably a little bit of learning and understanding of, of what assurance that will bring, fitting that. And it's, I think people perceive that you fit a sprinkle if it goes off, you know, you're, everything's going to be soaked and wet as such, but it's, it's, it's not that clear cut. Yeah, and I think that's an education issue as well. Tina, anything to add around that? Yeah, we, we ran the resident safety campaign last year 
several times and it was interesting to hear that the balancing of early engagement actually avoids the whole notion of court and, con and uh, conjunctions. So I think it's that whole thing of we've got a lot of things happening in the sector. We've got building a safer future. We've got the net zero conversation coming through. We've got the social housing and then we've got the consumer engagement white paper. But it's effectively what it does ultimately involve is, is residents. And if we can do early intervention to avoid that, then the best it will be. But I think it's a lot of there's a lot of best practice out there in smaller bubbles of how we collectively bring that together. Yes. I found it a bit rough at the moment. I don't know if everyone else is experiencing this. Um, David, could you turn your speaker down a little bit? I'm not blaming you. And <laughs> so, um, I guess going, going back to the pandemic, um, with sort of people are thinking about what services are essential and what services aren't essential. Have you been doing some thinking about that? About have you stopped doing any maintenance? Or probably repairs rather than maintenance, I guess. Yeah, the the organisations make it made a couple of decisions around um, around repairs and maintenance from a compliance point of view, which is working as normal. Um, urgent repairs and emergency repairs are still going ahead um, as they should do. So, um, but those non-essential in-house repairs, uh, so anything that's conducted within a property. Um, it's done on a it's done on a pretty small scale, and um, so they're still doing outside works, working in fencing and gardening and and roofing and all of those um, essential outside works. But uh, within the home, um, a, a lot of our organisation has, um, has stopped that as such. But uh, that's reviewed on a daily basis, so it'll, it'll also depend on what that repair may be. David, I yeah. think there's lots to discuss here, isn't there? I think we there's so much going on, isn't there? Should we take over for the rest of the afternoon, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Won't be a bad option. Thank you very much, David Mcnoff and Debbie, for supporting us on this morning. Um, lots of discussions coming through. Please do keep the questions coming through on the chat function. Um, we have got an exciting panel thereafter. We'll be able to answer your questions as well. But thank you very much. What we thank are. You. And uh, what we are going to be doing is I'm just going to introduce you to the next aspect of the Barnett case study, video case study. The case study is, um, gives you a glimpse of how Barnett homes have actually met their regular compliance needs using technology. Hello, I'm Tina Mystery from Acre, Southern Specification Manager. Today we're going to spend the whole day with Barnet Group and to really see how they're installing our products into different types of properties, but also to understand how they're really keeping the residents of Barnet safe. Today we're at Prospect Ring, which is a new build development for Barnet Group. I'm with Peter Chapman, the Fire Safety Project Manager. Peter, just why is Barnet installing ACO gateways and alarms in, in new builds? So we're here at Prospect Ring, which is a high-rise um, block um, that, that Hill Group are undertaking for us. And um, we're fitting the ACO system with a, a gateway um, for, for these flats. But again, it's not. this is not about um, high rise for us, it's about all of our buildings, all of our properties and it's about fire safety. And why was it important for you to install the gateway in new build? Well we, we want a, a link um, into our office so that we've got the full safety, we've got the dashboard so we can see where there are problems, where there are issues, they get highlighted very early uh, and we can actually rectify those issues and make sure they don't turn into, into fire situations. What grade category and centres are we using in this block here? So this is um, a D1 LD1 because it's a sprinkler system fitted within the flat um, and we're using multi-centres. Shall we then have a look? Yeah, great. <laughs> So 
So Pete, where are we now? Uh, this is Prospect Ring, uh, and this is uh, an existing 10-storey block uh, where we fit in the air core system as a retrospective system rather than the, the previous one, which was a new build system. And, that, and that's an interesting, you've, you've chosen to do even the 10-storey ones as well. Yeah, we have. It's, uh, we, we've actually fitted a, an LD1 system here. Um, we've also got a sprinkler system being fitted. Uh, so it's another indication of, of how Barnet are going over and above uh, the, re the requirements and actually fitting a more robust system that gives our residents a much uh, safer experience in their home. Now, I think it would be really good to go and speak to a resident of Florida to ask a few more questions as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm here with Florida. So when you moved in here, Florida, you had no alarms. No alarms. And now you've got alarms in every single room. And how does that make you feel? I feel better. I feel better because if we have this alarm, yeah, and we know that we had fire. I know that I had fire. Does it make you feel safer? Yes. Does it give you peace of mind? Yes. It's <laughs> Especially because you explained to me, it's uh, when I asked you, it's connected to the council, so they know where is the fire is, so I'm more safe. So uh, this is another existing block, 10 storey yes. block. Um, what we've got here is a, is a pilot flat and uh, we've got one of our contractors working inside uh, called George, shall I introduce you to? Yeah, go on then. Um, Joe, could you just tell us what it's been like to install the gateways in? Uh, yeah, in comparison to the uh, RF tool which was installed in Camden, it's a lot easier, the commissioning process is a lot faster. Um, obviously it gives good feedback to the client that if an alarm is taken down or anything they're, they're notified and stuff like that so yes I'd say it's a lot better system a lot more efficient. Okay if I give the choice of the RF tool versus the gateway what would you choose? If it was up to me I'd be installing the gateway all day long. Why? It's a lot easier to install and it's a lot quicker for us to commission. As a contractor are you proud to be working with a leading local authority that's got the largest amount of gateways in the whole of the UK? Yeah, definitely. Um, if it keeps people safe, that's, that's, that's all I care about. So I'd want my family safe if I was living in a tower block like this. So it's only fair that the residents are safe. So Peter, what's your experience been like working with ACO? It's been uh, it, it's been a new experience for me, actually, Tina. It's um, I wasn't really that familiar with um, the company or the products um, before I started working with Barnett. Um, but what I have found is that you know they're um, a real top class company with with really good products. I think the the level of of security and, and reassurance it gives me in in the specifying these products. Um, has, has been a bit of an eye opener. Um, I didn't realise the, the sort of how the technology is, had come on and, and the you know the systems and, and how we can monitor this remotely to keep um, you know to keep our residents safe. So it's it's been really interesting. In terms of the support, how have you found the support from us? Yeah, the support's been excellent. We um, you know any you know any technical queries that we have, help with specifications. Um, it, it's all available and it's it's really fast and. You know, with this type of work in, in the environment that we're in now, with you know, in the country with, with fire, um, it's really important to have that, that speedy turnaround and that, that technical support and that backup. And I know speaking to um, contractors, it's been um, it's certainly mirrored, that feeling is mirrored with our developers and our contractors. It has been amazing. Um, because it, it just it allows us to see from our computer screens what's really going on in people's homes. Um, we we had a um, a notification through the uh, through the dashboard from a property with a with a gateway installed. It actually had a CO alarm in it, and um, the resident re had removed the head of the alarm. That notified um, Barnet Homes in the office. Um, we then dispatched a, an engineer 
to look at it. The engineer um, immediately disconnected the cooker and said the, it was the worst levels of, of CO2 that he'd ever recorded in his career. And, um, you know, and he said he was amazed that nobody had died. So that's the sort of, that's the difference that, that we're getting with these products. And how have you found the potential, the next stage we're going is, is the engagement bit with residents. And how important is that for you and how do you see that support from us with you? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, for me, that's really exciting because I think that's that's the key to all of it, is is making sure we work with our residents, make sure that, that they understand the systems. Um, you know, if, if we just dump a system on, on a resident and say, get on with it, um, they won't interact with it. So, you know, having the things like the fridge magnets and, the, you know, the, the documents and the easy to use guides, the things that, that you support has been brilliant. And obviously, we, you know, we, we brand that with, with Aco and with our own logo on it um, so that people understand that we're tied in that process as well. It's not just a product literature, it's something that Barnett have bought into. Um, you know, that we want, we actually want, you know, we want it to be um, an inclusive process for the residents. Uh, and, and I think it's really important that they get that um, understanding of, of how these things keep them safe. So, you know, there's a big there's a big resident piece and we've had really good support on you for that. It's been a brilliant day, spending the whole day with Peter Chapman at Barnet Group and understanding exactly how they're installing in the 1000 gateways, along with the 5000 devices attached to them. But what's been really nice is, it's just to hear how they really pride themselves on keeping residents of Barnet safe. It's always weird looking at yourself on a case study or a video, isn't it? Uh, but what you saw there was just a glimpse of what Barnet Homes are doing. The whole day, spending the whole day with them was really interesting, especially around the fact that how they really want to keep their residents safe. And their actual main focus is about keeping residents safe and meeting their regulatory compliance needs as a second requirement. And uh, what, we, what we will be doing is uh, Peter Chapman will be um, coming on to a Q&A with us on the 25th of February. Gavin uh, Bass will also be joining us on the 25th of February and he's also on the panel. So please feel free to carry on asking questions about the specific case study. What you saw there was only a small glimpse. Um, since that recording back in October, they're at 1,700 gateways now with almost 10,000 devices attached to them. And the speed of where they're delivering the work is amazing. It's not just from the commitment from the contractors, but the commitment from Barney itself in terms of how they have installed in the gateways, not just in one type of program of work, but many. So they're installing them on the new build, as you saw there, the high rise and mid rise and including new build. So the gateway has been a versatile way of them actually meeting their compliance needs, um, but also making sure that residents always kept safe and actually they save lives. And since that recording there, we've also had further incidents where they've had high levels of CO um, and actually they've intervened and contractors have actually gone in and they've been surprised that no one's actually been killed. Um, so it's not just about the fact that they've introduced the gateways into the properties, into the programs of works. It's also about how they're seeing the return on investment of those gateways and how they're actually setting their foundation up for future delivery of environmental sensors as we enter into the net zero conversation. So they're seeing the value of the gateway in terms of meeting the requirements on building a safer future. Um, on the how the white consumer engagement white paper and they also create the platform for engagement and actually landing and looking at the delivery of the net zero conversation moving forward. But please do join us. There will be a link sent out shortly within the next few days for you to be invited to a further in-depth discussion, open, transparent conversation with Gavin Bass um, and Peter Chapman from Barnet Homes. Um, and it's going to be an informative but informal. So we're going to have a, an hour and a half with them, 45 minutes an open conversation and 45 minutes thereafter for us as a sector to share best practice. So thank you very much. Uh, we are going to be having a short break right now, so please do, in the meantime, keep the questions coming through, and we'll look, we look forward to seeing you back at 2 p.m.
Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks again for, for joining us here today, uh, the Smarter Ways to Compliance, our, uh, our event this afternoon. Um, this session, we're going to actually look at, uh, focus on the technology. So we're going to focus on the, the gateway. Uh, and we're going to look at how that can uh, support you when it comes to um, compliance and, and areas of compliance. And so we're going to explore uh, a brief introduction into the product. So for them who haven't seen it beforehand or haven't used it, um, we'll, we'll cover the main points. And then we're actually going to delve into a, a live demo. So we'll be jumping on to the web portal, so really the data end of what you, what you get off the back of the gateway, uh, and exploring around that and, and, and examining what sort of events and what reporting we can get from, from that side. So um, yeah, so to start with then, we're going to start with a, a short uh, presentation just to cover the main sort of background points. So um, in terms of the, uh, the gateway itself then, um, to give an overview on, uh, on the system, we're looking at a system whereby um, you have alarms within a, a property. Those alarms are communicating wirelessly around the entire system. So they're sending out RF signals um, around the whole system uh, and those signals, those messages, will contain information on the alarm status um, and, and what's actually actively happening within that, that alarm system. The gateway itself is, is, is the part that you see in the center of this diagram here, and that is um, the key component that, that joins that system, if you will, within the property. Um, and that is then uh, listening out for those RF messages, gathering those events, and it has its own uh, connection in it, has a, a 2G SIM built within inside the unit, that's then using that data connection to send all information up to a, a web portal, which you see on the, the far end of the, the diagram there. So effectively, the, the gateway system has been built for scalability. So really, this scenario could be one property. It could be tens of properties, hundreds, or uh, as we saw with Barnet, even potentially thousands. So uh, it's really given you um, an overview of uh, these properties and the alarm status remotely. So that's, that's what we're trying to get around, is what's happening within that property without having to go out to the property, um, but having that real-time insight and, and view of it. So in terms of the main components then that we have as part of the, um, part of the system then, so we have um, the, obviously the alarms. So the alarms themselves, you can see on there is a small RF module shown uh, next to that unit. That's obviously what we mentioned about uh, the RF signals that are reporting the events and the status of the alarms within the, the system. Uh, then the next components we have, we, we've, we've mentioned the gateway, so that's the other piece of hardware that we have uh, within that system. And then either side of that, we have two pieces of software effectively that are, that are supporting it uh, and enabling us to install it. So the first one being the, uh, the SmartLink app. So we're using this, you can see on a, on a handset, um, to install the system when you're actually in the property. So that's set up and configure it. That's recording things like property information. It's recording what rooms and areas the alarms are installed in. Uh, but we're also giving that as a tool then. So if, um, if somebody needs to go back out and visit that property and actually get uh, an information and status on the alarms when they're actually there, then they can go via the app and view of any installation that's linked to their account uh, and, and examine the events they're attached to any particular unit within that system. And we'll explore some of that later on when we hit the portal um, to, to show you what that would look like. The portal itself, um, we've mentioned that already, we've touched on it, but that is a, a web-based insight into all of the collective data that my connected gateway is, are, are sending up. So again, that's giving you a central point where you can, you can gather all that information uh, on, on all the connected alarm systems across um, housing, housing uh, properties and actually view that centrally. Uh, and obviously that is web-based, there's no software to install with that. Um, we do have a login system, which again, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on shortly. So from a point of view of, of compliance, there's, a, there's an important area that um, we wanted to touch on when it comes to the SmartLink app. So when we're actually installing the alarm system, um, you can see on the, the back of the alarm uh, that's shown on the, on, on the, the image there, we have two QR codes on the back of the unit. So we have one on the alarm itself, and we have one on, in this case, the SmartLink module that's within the back of the unit. So the SmartLink module, remember, is giving us our RF interconnection uh, within that system. These QR codes are, um, are, are vital, really, because they give us the, the model number, um, 
of the unit and the module, so we know exactly what's actually been installed in terms of the type of alarm. Um, it's also given us the manufacturing date code, so we then know uh, when that unit was manufactured, and therefore we know when it's due for replacement. So again, from a compliance perspective, we can actually keep track of that, you know, and, and, and ensure an alarm is, is replaced before it reaches the end of its life. Um, the third part that we're capturing as part of that is a unique serial number. So again, that's key really in that if we're accurately reporting on events that happen within the system, it's vital that we have that, that level of serial number identification so we can pin exact events back to exact units within the properties. So the app handles all that information automatically, so it's a simple scan, as you can see, uh, shown on the image there using the camera on the, on the device. But that's essentially what we're capturing, and that's where we're feeding all that information up to the portal and where our, our data is, is, is really is pinned against. So to give us a, a, a short recap then really on, on the gateway itself. So we're looking at a system that is designed to link alarms uh, across in any number of, of, of properties to a uh, central point. So as a, a social housing provider, really giving you that tool to, to monitor all your systems uh, collectively. Um, the, the portal itself is cloud-based, so we are um, transferring that up from the gateway using that data connection we mentioned to a uh, cloud based portal, so we can then access that information from anywhere via a, via a login and a, and a web browser. The, the gateway itself um, is designed to be an integral part of the alarm system, so it is designed to be within the property. We talked about that R RF messages that it's actually listening to uh, and interacting with. Um, it is mains powered and therefore it is a fixed point of install in there. It's not designed to be something where the resident would interact with. So um, typically speaking, that would be installed out of the way, for example, electrical cupboard, um, or we've also had some users install them in, in attic spaces, in bungalows. So it's really, is, as long as it's got RF signal, it can just sit in the background uh, and, and, and take those messages in and report on them. We do have a SIM within the unit. Um, it is a roaming SIM. Uh, there's no setup or configuration with it. So out of the box, power the unit, it will search around, it will look for uh, its best network connection, it will latch on to that, and, and, and again, there's no other configuration needed. Um, that's built in as, as standard. Um, the reason we've gone down that route is to give us, which we'll, we'll, we'll look at later on in some coverage diagrams, nationwide coverage. So we want a product that um, you can install potentially in any, any property all over the UK, switch it on, and, it, and it's gonna find a connection straight away. We have our management on a, on a desktop uh, dashboard, so that's the portal. And again, we've touched on the, the setup using the, the SmartLink app. So those are all the sort of core components of the, of the system. In terms of compatible alarms then, um, we have obviously our flagship 3000 series with, with SmartLink RF modules, which we, we looked at before with the QR code uh, image. So obviously we have full compatibility across uh, all our multi-sensor and single sensor alarms from that, that series, but it's important that we've actually, um, we've built in backwards compatibility as well as part of the, the gateway. So if you had the, um, uh, the sort of precursor to that series really, the 2110E or the 160E that you see shown there um, with the Radlink Plus modules, then there is still compatibility with the gateway. So an existing alarm system that's perhaps installed in a property for, for maybe two or three years, um, there is the option there just to add the gateway into that system. Um, those units are sending out those RF messages with their event data anyway, um, so the gateway being installed can then capture those events and, and, and report on them. That's our sort of main side really. We do have battery products that will, uh, that will link as well. So one of the big things we are seeing is more mixed systems. Uh, within properties, mixture of mains and, and, and battery on some occasions. Um, to that end, we do have our, our 600 series, which is our, our battery smoke and heat alarms, and 208s would be our carbon monoxide alarms. So again, we've covered on, on both of those. We do have accessories as well. We've got an accessory in the sort of live system here that we'll show you in a second, a control switch we can see on there. But yeah, we do have full, full accessories as well that can be added into the system. So um, a good cross section of, of units that are um, compatible with the, with the gateway itself. So now if we look at what events can we actually get from the system. So here you can see a, a breakdown of 
the full events reporting that we're able to, to report on. Um, the top two you'd really see were, were sort of obvious ones you'd expect really, so FAR activations, CO activations. Um, you can see when it comes to CO, the carbon monoxide activations, we actually were able to um, report on whether it's a high, medium or low level of CO that's actually triggered that unit. So on all three occasions, everything, the alarms will, will sound, um, but we're actually reporting on the actual PPM range that the alarm has, uh, has detected. When it's, when it's actually triggered. Um, moving down the list then, we do have um, aspects around power. So we do monitor, you can see there for SmartLink units for our 3000 series, we do monitor the mains power supply. Um, so that is an aspect that gives you good insight into um, potential wiring issues or, 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 or obviously power cuts in a, in a particular area. So we're able to, to, to monitor on that. Uh, and again, we've got related events such as a low battery on there as well. Um, head removed would be um, somebody removing an alarm from its base plate. So effectively a tamper type message. Um, the alarms themselves do have um, locking latches on their base plates. Um, however, if, if somebody is really determined, removes that unit, then it is able to report that it's actually been removed uh, and get that information um, via, the, via the portal. But it's not just sort of uh, maintenance or, 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 or alarm type events that we report on. So we do actually report as well on normal uh, events. So again, from a compliance perspective, one of the more interesting events we report on is, is a button test. So again, can, uh, we can get an insight into, uh, is the resident actually testing their alarm system and, and how often are they test it and when was it last tested? So it's giving a, a, good, um, a good indication um, from that point of view and giving that, that insight. You can see there the gateway we're actually reporting separately. So um, it does sort of self-report on, it, on, it, on its own status. And again, there you can see the breakdown um, of the events. The gateway check-in that we refer to on there would essentially be um, a heartbeat. So an, in a normal uh, system, if nothing is happening, everything is quite happy there in, in standby, um, then we actually ping up a, a heartbeat or a check-in message um, every 12 hours from that system to prove that we have that, that connectivity. If an event occurs, it will be sent up straight away. So we're not waiting for that time period. It's only if, it's, if the system is sitting there in, in, in standby effectively. In terms of the, the overall coverage, so the gateway we first um, launched the product back in, in January in 2020. And um, since that, that, that date, we've actually had over 4,800 systems installed uh, across the UK. So this is across a number of different uh, clients and, and users. Um, as you can see there on the map, uh, a wide coverage range all across the, the UK. Um, when we then look at the number of devices that are actually connected to, the, to those 4,800 gateways, um, we have over 28,500 uh, devices connected. So that would be alarms, accessories, so that the, the, the units that we saw earlier on in the, in the compatibility list. So it's, it's a huge range of, of devices that are, that are connected in, um, and obviously we'll, we'll now we'll, we'll, we'll jump onto in a second the level of data that's actually been collected from, from all those devices. Um, if you break that down, we've actually had over 200 client accounts across there. So each client would have their own account, and they could then install gateways under their account, and that would be how they would get visibility of just their own gateways, and then obviously would have separate accounts for, for separate users. So clients would, would, would range from social housing providers to um, some private landlords as well, uh, mixed within that. But real advantage is getting that remote insight into uh, all the connected systems under your, your account. So in terms of all the, all the uh, devices that we've, uh, that we've talked about there connected, the events reporting that we've seen, uh, the totals, is, uh, is shown here. So you can see at the bottom there, if you look at the bottom figure, um, almost 1.2 million system messages have been collected. So that's, that's live data that's been sent up from all of those connected systems uh, all across the UK uh, in, into, this, into the um, uh, gateway and, and the portal system itself. In terms of the, the higher uh, events there, so the mains absent that you see at the top there, really interesting one. Typically speaking, what we tend to see is that 
you know, this could be a void property. So this could be where um, it's between residents. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an opportunity to go in there and refurbish the property. Uh, and that's typically when a gateway would get installed um, within that property, obviously easier in terms of access, which we, we talked about in, the, in, in sort of earlier sessions this afternoon. Um, so that's where we would see, see that. But again, that could indicate as well, which we'll, we'll look on on the portal, um, potentially a, a card meter or uh, even a mains wiring issue in a, in a system. That could be a good flag and, and insight around that. The next one's down then, so fire alarm activation. Um, really what this could, could indicate is this can be, give a good insight. Obviously, if, if, if there is a fire alarm activation, this could be um, what actually been, been seen on there, but it could also indicate where a, a change of alarm sensor type may actually benefit and um, potentially reduce any nuisance activation. So for example, switching to a multi-sensor alarm from a single sensor product um, may actually alleviate if that's, if that's actually been the cause of the, the events. So, um, so again, we can see the, the total numbers there, could be some good, good investigation off the back of that. The button testing that we talked about, so, so that compliance perspective and encouraging the residents to, to test their, their own systems. Um, remote tests and button tests. Remote tests would be a, a remote test switch. That would be a product mounted on the wall to test the entire system. Uh, button tests would be an individual test from an from alarm within that, uh, within that system itself. Um, some reasonable numbers, however, when you look at and, and compare it with the total number of, of messages and events that we've seen, um, it just shows there really is a, a sort of case for encouraging that regular testing. Um, and that's certainly something I think as an industry we can, we can, um, we can, we can approach and we can, we can move on. Um, the ones at the, the bottom then, the CO alarm activations, and again, you can see as we, we touched on the segregation between low, medium and high when it comes to those events. Um, lower numbers, however, if a carbon monoxide alarm is triggering, it is carbon monoxide that's, that's, that's present. So you can see that's showing us just the advantages of having um, that connectivity in that, say, in that system, seeing that data. Um, obviously, you, you heard about um, Tina referred to it with, um, with, with Barnet, and we've heard it with, with, with others as well, where CO alarms have actually activated and found, they found the source of uh, the CO leak through the reporting. So it's telling us what alarms actually triggered, where it's located in the property, and then the devices can be investigated from that point. So some really valuable insight. This is really only the start of it. Um, as more systems get connected, then um, higher level of data gives us, um, gives us a really good um, insight and target to look at collectively uh, all across the, across the UK. Okay, so that's given us a short introduction into the gateway uh, system itself. So now we're gonna move on to um, the live demo um, part of the, uh, of the session. So if we move now, move across, just wanna show you um, what we have in, in, in front of us here. So we do actually have a, a live system set up um, here. So if we now talk around the, the units that we've got as part of this system. So we have two multi-sensor um, alarms here. So they're from our 3000 series. They both have smart link modules within them. We have the, the gateway itself here. So that is um, connected and I say is an integral part of that, of that system. Um, and at the front here, we have an alarm control switch. So this is where we saw the remote test on the events list. This would be an event that this unit would report on. So somebody pressing this button would enable a test of their entire alarm system. Um, this does also allow them to control any activations that may happen and find the source of the activation within the property itself. When we um, looked at the units and we looked at the QR codes, this is what we see on the, on the back here. So you can see the QR codes on the back of the units, one being in the module and one being on the alarm itself. So this system has been um, uploaded. It is live. Um, it's been running now for, um, for a couple of weeks and we've actually been pushing some events through the system. So now um, we wanna show you what events we can, we can actually view now and view those events on the, on the portal itself. So if we start with the, the portal, so this is our um, dashboard view. So again, from a compliance perspective, um, what our aim was to give a, a really simple indicator um, at the top here through these two circles. So effectively, um, if they're both green, then everything is okay with our alarm systems that are, that are connected. So um, this is, um, again, something we've designed to be 
uh, that, that quick sort of visual indicator. It's given us a percentage breakdown at the bottom. So it's showing us how many systems we've got installed collectively, and again, how many devices are, uh, are under those systems. So that's our view. We're logged in as our demo clients. So these are all our demo systems that are leading to these events and these notifications and this red shading section that we see on here. So again, that's given us a really, really good insight straight away to say, actually, you know, there's some areas that we, um, we need to focus on and, and, and address in terms of the systems that are connected to our, to our accounts. So good quick visual indicator. We have um, a similar one on the right hand side here. So this is just a, a rolling week view. So it's giving us um, indication of events that have, that have occurred at particular times of a week. So anytime an event occurs, we uh, increment the counter here. And you can see the color coding that we see on the bar here ties down to these three panels below it. These three panels below it are actually what is happening as of now, as of this point in, in time. So this alarm activations panel that we, that we have here is, is currently blank. So what that's actually telling us is that across our 28 systems and 83 devices, there's no alarms in alarm state as of this point in time. If we did, we would have the information displayed on this, uh, on this box here. You can see how that, would, how that would look when we move across to the next box. So this is our priority maintenance um, box. And what we have within here, if I scroll through some of these events, you can see we have lots of head removed events from various different systems. So we're able to see the event, the unique property reference number, the room, and the event date. So this has given us a good, a simple snapshot into any active and live events. So the fact that we have data within this segment is telling us that these alarms have been removed and they are still off their, their bases. So if they were refitted, they would actually clear from this panel. However, when we drill into the installation section, information and events would still be recorded against the, the system itself. The final box that we have here is our general maintenance area. So within here, we're reporting on things like low battery and mains absence types of events. So if we did have a mains absence, say on a, a 3000 series alarm, the alarm would, would report on it. So it would immediately uh, notify on, on, on the fact that it has lost its mains power supply. However, it does have a rechargeable backup built in, so it would immediately switch to that. Uh, and that would continue to power the unit uh, and obviously give that protection. So that's why we sort of segregated it across these two these two boxes here from those, those events types. Um, the gateway itself as well will have its own rechargeable backup. And again, that would report um, on, on a mains absent, as you can see on some of the events here. So that's our dashboard view. So that's our quick sort of snapshot really um, into the system. So now if we drill in a bit further and we click into um, our installations. So here we're able to see those 27 uh, systems that we had connected to our, um, our account are visible here um, collectively. So we can then see the property reference number, the postcode, the address, the date installed, size of the system, and we also have status again on this end column here. So again, we wanted to use color coding throughout really, so it's a good quick visual indicator uh, into the into the system itself. Um, you can ex obviously extend this view, so if you wanted to see our further systems, there we have the ones that are connected here. This is a, um, a, a default view that we're seeing here in terms of the columns. However, what we can see as well is if we wanted to look at who installed the systems, we can actually switch that column on as a view, and now we have that information showing on the end column here. So again, from a sort of compliance uh, perspective and, a, and, a, and a, uh, a really a traceability, seeing who actually physically installed that system first off, um, again, that information is recorded. Where that is actually coming from is the login to the SmartLink app. So as an installer, uh, the installer would have a login, log into the app, install the system, 
uh, and then that's where this information is, is, is tied back to their login account. We have uh, this system here. So this is the one that we have just looked at on the table in front of us today. So this is our, uh, our live system. So again, we're now drilling into this. So we're looking at, at, at more granular data related to this individual system. So we can see the, uh, we can see the address where it's installed. Again, we've mentioned about the installer. If we scroll down, it's giving us now a full uh, breakdown of the alarms and accessories that are installed within that property. When installing via the SmartLink app, the installer would select which room they've installed the, uh, the model or the product into. This is a, uh, a drop-down selection, which you can see on here, some of the, the selections there. However, um, one feedback, uh, one, um, uh, <laughs> one uh, addition that we made to the SmartLink app uh, through customer feedback was to add in uh, custom naming. So against the dropdown, uh, the installer can actually add any custom text that they wish uh, against the device. So typically the feedback was um, we could get a general location from the dropdown. However, as you can see here, there's a real benefit to adding in extra information through free text, which is recorded on the, uh, the portal uh, throughout its view on here and also any events that are reported from each individual system. So it gives a really good insight and allows somebody going out to that property to pinpoint exactly where that unit is um, within the property due to various different layouts um, across different, different housing types. If you look across, you look at the data installed here, so you can see that these actually vary. So we have um, a varying age of devices across here. So even though they've all had the same installed date, our age is, is different. So what we're actually doing, if we think back and we, we, we look at that QR scan that we were doing on the products, and we talked about how that's grabbing the manufacturing date code of the product. So we're actually grabbing the exact age of each single unit that we're installing in the system through that QR code scanning. So typically what you can find is, is something like you see shown here, whereby not every alarm or every uh, product within the system has the same age. So uh, again, if a system was installed and then maybe a couple of years down the line, it was extended, so an extra alarm was added into that system or an existing alarm was replaced, then our replacement dates would actually be out of sync. So every single product wouldn't have the same uh, replacement date. However, with the portal and with the gateway, it's tracking through that QR code scanning the exact replace by date on there. So again, from a compliance perspective, we know exactly when we need to replace those units, how long uh, their life is that they have left uh, remaining, uh, and therefore we can replace it before it, that life is actually exceeded. We have a, a status at the end here. So we have again a color coded indicator on each individual unit's status. We're showing signal strengths here. So these indicators here show RF signal strength from these units back to the gateway. We mentioned about the SIM within the gateway. So this is actually our SIM uh, network coverage, our signal strength that we have shown here from the gateway. So again, that's very similar to the bars on your mobile phone, exactly the same type of principle. So that's our, uh, an overview of our system. We then look into the, uh, the event summary. Now, this is now showing us every single event that has happened to that system um, from the moment we have installed it. So again, we can see on here, there's lots of events, lots of data that we're looking at. So um, everything on here is recorded from the moment the gateway is added to the system. We have um, a roll up of the number of events. So again, you can see a quick tally here and a quick check on how many times an event has occurred within a property. So it's given a real good indicator as to what's actually happening um, are there any repeated events that are happening within a, within a system? What we can also do though, is through the event details tab, we can drill into that. So if we look down on here, we can see there are CO activations here. So we've got three high level CO activations. So now let's go and drill into that a bit further. So we can go into our event details, we can show filters, and if we actually select, so we wanna look at high level alarm, and we can also select low-level alarm as well. 
So we've selected two filters here. So this is looking at event types in this top section here. However, we could also look by a model uh, within that system, or we could look at by location. So again, those are the sort of reporting uh, aspects we could look by, and we could even narrow it down to a particular date range. But for this uh, demo, we'll just circle the, uh, the, select the events here that we have, apply those filters, and now you can see an individual breakdown of every single uh, time that that event type has occurred. So now, what is this actually telling us? What are we learning from this information? So we have the location. So immediately we can see here, it's consistently, it's the kitchen that has given us that, that CO activation. It's the same model. So we have our, um, as we mentioned, a multi-sensor heat and CO alarm combined. That's actually giving us the event reporting on each, on each uh, occasion, as you can see here. We can see the breakdown of events, but the interesting aspect is when we look on this side. So we look at the individual event dates and times that are, these uh, alarm activations have occurred. So you can see here we have consecutive days and we have a very similar sort of time frame around these types of events occurring. So from this type of information, looking into this, this data in a bit more detail, we know that from this, there will be a, a appliance within the kitchen that is causing these CO activations. If we look at the timestamps that we're seeing on here, then that could suggest something like uh, a gas cooker. So are the residents actually, you know, is that, is that when they're cooking within that, um, within that room, that area, or if a boiler uh, was actually sited within that room, again, is there um, an occasion when that boiler is actually switching on um, at that, that point in time? So we can really get some, some good insight um, through just looking at a bit more detail into this, this date and time stamps across the event. So if we now look at another scenario, so we'll just clear this CO filters that we've shown here. And let's look at the, um, the other type of alarm activation. So let's look at fire. So now um, we can see a different breakdown. So this is giving us the 3024 in the hallway. And again, we've got different events and times. So they are quite spaced out. Um, there is obviously different times and, and, and dates within these. Um, what you could look at, if you looked at a fire alarm activation and you saw there was lots of activations from a particular property and you drilled into the detail as we are doing here, then this could potentially indicate if it was say a single sensor alarm that was the cause of, of activations. And again, from the location you could see, is, is, it, is it close to the kitchen area? Could it potentially be um, nuisance activation from, from cooking rooms potentially? Then um, that may be an argument then to say we could swap to a multi-sensor uh, alarm, which again would alleviate those um, those issues uh, and, and and fix the the nuisance alarming. So again, that can give us a good breakdown, good insight. We'll now we'll clear our um, fire alarm activation. Um, the other area we wanted to to look into was a mains absent fault. So we talked about here how we can report on this separately. So. We have a mains absent fault that would come out of a, an alarm. In this case, our 3000 series alarms we've got as part of the system. But we also report on the gateway separately. So if we select both of those and then apply that as a filter. So what we can see here, there's been immediately, there's been lots of activity uh, in, this, in this particular system around the mains. If we scroll down uh, right to the bottom, so what we can see here we can see the gateway, the 3028 heat and CO alarm, and 3024 multi-sensor optical heat alarm. So the three um, alarms or, or gateway as well that's part of the system, they've all lost their mains power supply at the same date and time. So if looking at this end column here, everything has gone off to that property all at once. So that's indicating pretty much the mains has, has, has completely dropped from that um, from that uh, circuit at least, but probably that property uh, all at once. That could indicate something like a card meter uh, in the property running out of credit. Um, so again, that can give a, a good insight. If we had just seen one unit in the system showing a mains absent fault, then that could indicate um, a particular issue with that unit. So we've seen from live gateway systems, the ones we referred to earlier, we've actually seen um, wiring issues reported. So we've had alarms that have been wired off uh, switched live 
uh, supply rather than a permanent life from the lighting circuit. We've also had alarms that have been damaged from water ingress into the back of the unit, and that's actually damaged and blown the, 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 the tripped out the main supply uh, to that alarm. So again, looking across the whole system at these same events types, and just, just looking and seeing what units are actually reporting it, can get, again give us that, that indication as to what the, um, what the source could be. The other area we just wanted to, to touch on, if we clear those filters out, is testing. So if we look at button tests and we look at remote tests, so we have a alarm control switch as part of the system, so that's where we would look at our remote tests here. So if we now apply those filters uh, onto the, the system, and we have our test showing here. So what it's showing us here, again, looking at it from a compliance perspective, a remote test here that we're seeing from the 450, the control switch, that remote test will test the entire system. So the resident pressing that controller will test every aspect of the system itself. If we see a button test here, then that's an individual button test on that one particular unit. So again, we have that full uh, traceability as to what's, uh, what's happened and how the residents are testing um, their system. So that's our uh, installations. We can also set up um, notifications as part of the system. So if we actually wanted notifications to come through, um, from this system on uh, events. We, this, here's how we set it up. And again, this is an extra feature that we recently um, launched and, and included in the portal, is a breakdown of fire and CO events. So we would select a contact here. We have um, service contacts. So that would cover things like head removal, gateway mains absent. And again, you can see here, we can select email or text message uh, notification. So again, that can go to any contact that we wish. So once a contact set up with an email name and a telephone number, um, then they can be selected as part of this um, section that we're seeing here. So we can add that on. Um, the other columns that we have here, fire activation, fire contacts would be any fire act activations. And again, we could choose email, text, or a combination of both. And CO, again, email, text. So any CO alarm activations, that would when a uh, notification would be sent. The update that we pushed was actually splitting these out. So previously we had alarm activations rolled together. However, what we found is that users of the system um, would want particular notifications um, switched on, others um, potentially switched off, and they would want different notifications going to different sets of contacts. So for example, serial notifications could go to a gas team, um, specifically around those, um, those particular notifications. And again, fire could go somewhere separately if, uh, if the user wished. So that's how we'd, um, we'd actually set them up. The other option we do have, if we go back to our installations view, so that's adding a contact to a um, particular individual system. We could, however, select a number of properties, number of systems, and we can add them to a group. So we can set up groups on here, and we can add properties to groups, then um, within that grouping, we can find our group here. If we look into this, we can see our installs that are assigned to the group, which we just assigned a second ago. And we can say, actually, we want that going to a particular contact or a set of contacts. So again, that would be how we would uh, apply a grouping and then apply contacts to a particular group. So that can be useful if, for example, you have um, sheltered accommodation and you have a number of properties that you want um, notifications going to, perhaps as an on-site warden, then you could group all those properties together, add the warden into that, and then um, the notifications would go through to that, to that person or those people. Um, but again, that could be a, a, a central office, and then each time a property is added, you could just assign it to a central group. For those notifications to to go through, we do have some basic reporting as well um, built into the the portal. So again, we looked at the replacement dates of the units, and uh, we looked at the QR code scanning and how we know the exact age of units. So what we're able to do now is to look at a, a point in time in the future, pick a date, and what the system will do is bring back all the units 
that will need replacing by that date that we've selected. So you can see the individual replace buys here. We have all the units shown, individual properties, where they're installed within that property, and we could export that to a CSV if we wanted just the raw data that we've shown in here. So again, from a compliance perspective, that's giving you an easy way through that QR code scanning, tying into then our portal view and our replacement report. It's ensuring we've got tools then to uh, it replace the alarms before they reach the end of their, their life. The second report that we have is a, a fault report. So here we're showing basically everything that is read on the dashboard. So we saw lots of events on the dashboard when we looked at that earlier, and that's what we're seeing here in this, um, in this fault report. So this is giving us really a list that we need to then approach from perhaps a maintenance perspective. Um, if an event then is actually resolved from this list, so for example, this alarm here is showing a uh, head removed, if that alarm is actually refitted within that property, then this would clear from this report. But remember, it would still be recorded against the event summary on that uh, particular system. The final area we've got we just want to touch on is our users. So we're able to control um, user access via our, our user section. And this is where we would um, look at uh, giving access to different types of users, client admin or uh, installers. Uh, I think I'll just refresh, oh, it is loading up. So again, we can give two different types of, of user logins. We can give uh, a client admin and we can give an installer level login. So we can uh, control that from that, that area in the portal. So what we're now gonna actually do as well is we're gonna remove a unit from, from the system. So we've removed this, this down. Our gateway's reported on that and we can see our sort of head removes on here. So if we do a, a, a refresh, then we have popped right to the top here, the event date. We click into that. This is our live system and immediately we've got that showing here on the system. So that's how we would report through. Um, and again, you saw then the alarm removal, then how that's reflecting on the, the portal itself. Okay, so that's sort of round up the, the demo side of uh, the session uh, this afternoon. So we've looked at no view of the gateway. We looked at various areas of compliance that the gateway can assist with. So again, tracking that, um, uh, that the products that are installed, their age. We've looked at having that event history against the system, um, being able to view that, being able to drill into it, to look at particular events. And we've also looked at our reporting that can help with replacements and can also look at um, uh, faults and sort of maintenance type uh, reports as well. So if we now um, open out to, I think we've got time for a, for a couple of questions. Um, if there's any questions that we've, that we've got on there. Um, okay, so what we've got on here, we've got a question in from uh, Wayne Francis. So is the replacement date clearly marked on the outside of the unit? Uh, it is, yes. So we have actually two um, replacement dates labels on, on the unit itself. So against the QR code scan, uh, we can actually see uh, where we have the label on the back of the product, we are showing the, um, the QR code label. We can see the actual uh, replace by date there, and we also have it on the side of the unit shown here. The reason we went with a two label approach is this one is obviously is, is, is visible from the side of the unit, but if that does get painted over, you still have your replacement um, date shown on the back here. But again, the good thing with the gateway is obviously you're capturing that information, so it's always gonna be on the portal, regardless of what, what happens to the unit itself. So yeah, thanks Wayne, um, good, good question. Um, so a question from Rachel, so does the gateway system pick up issues with internal issues such as heating or gas? Um, so we're not looking at those aspects um, as yet. However, um, these are areas where we're looking for the future. So we want to be able to report on 
uh, much more aspects of, of, of a status of a property um, from a collective, collective system, really. So we're looking at fire and CO uh, currently, and obviously the accessories we've mentioned. However, the real core of it is the gateway is that element in the system that we can then expand out from, and we can add in extra sensors um, to give more information, really, and, and still using that portal structure to report, report back on. A uh, question from Peter Colley. So is there a lifetime cost for use of the portal? Um, there isn't. So we don't have, it's a question we get asked a lot, is, is there sort of an ongoing subscription type cost? Um, and the answer is no. So everything we've mentioned about the, the gateway and the SIM, um, all the cost is, is the one-off cost is the product itself. So initial um, purchase cost of the, of the product, um, and that then covers all data that's sent up the use of the app, use of the portal, so there's no hidden extras. Um, we want to keep things simple, uh, and that's that's the approach we've we've taken. So uh, I think we've got time for a, a final question. Um, so Jonathan Rees, can you download the data from the app with regard to install and replacement dates to upload into an asset management system? So um, you can access that information on the app. So via the SmartLink app, you can drill into each individual system. So we didn't have time to, to cover it today. However, um, it is accessible within the, the app itself. Um, from the portal, you can extract uh, that information. So if you went into your uh, replacement report and you extracted that information, that would give you uh, the age of the units, their replacement dates. Um, you could export that as a CSV for the raw data. Where we're looking at for future is we're looking at um, potential API direct integrations of that information into other systems. So again, that's something we have on the roadmap for future developments. Okay, so yeah, thank you again for all the, uh, the questions we've received. So um, I'll now hand over to my colleague, Andy Speak. So Andy's gonna take us through um, the next session this afternoon. So. Over to Andy, thank you. That's great, thanks Mike. So yes, good afternoon and welcome to our last session of the afternoon where we've got a panel discussion. Be joined with a few different panelists who are all experts in the field of compliance. So we're gonna go out and I'll introduce you to the panelists at the moment. I believe a couple of the panelists may be having a few issues connecting, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how we get on with that, but I'm sure we'll be we're absolutely fine with, with who we have joining us. So after the discussion, we should have some time to uh, open up to questions from the audience as well. So I, I ask you all to use the, the chat feature on the side of the screen to ask as many questions as you can, and we'll try to get through as many of those as well as we can. So if I, I can introduce you to the panel, if we can bring the panel on, onto screen and see who, who has been able to join us so far. So I think we're, we're still just waiting for a handful at the moment. Oh no, I have company, which is great. So good afternoon, Gavin. Hi there, good afternoon. Can you hear and see me okay? I can, yes. Excellent. Well, it's good to have somebody with me. It would have been a very dull panel discussion if it was just myself on my own. So um, <laughs> hi, Al Alistair. Good afternoon. I think people are just sorting out video and audio, so we'll just give everybody a couple of seconds just to make sure everybody can hear one another. So, yeah, what I'm going to do is hand over to yourself, Gavin, just while we wait for Alistair to, to, to bring his camera and his mic back up. And if you could uh, just give us a brief introduction to yourself, please. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Gavin Bass. I'm the Senior Compliance Manager for Barnet Homes. I oversee all the building and fire safety and compliance matters, um, which um, I'm Includes systems. Thank you very much. And Alistair, can you uh, give us a, Alistair, a brief introduction you, for yourself, please? Brief for yourself, please. Uh, yeah, I'm Alistair Weir. I'm the maintenance officer for Charing Cross Housing Association in Glasgow. Um, fantastic. So, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> that, that's brilliant. That's absolutely yeah, fine. That's brilliant. That's absolutely fine. The intention is we are hoping the to have a couple more joiners as well. Um, so we're hoping to have Mark uh, Hogan so and Vicky Lang as well join us. I believe there's possibly a few connection issues, so as soon as we can get them to join us, the better. Um, but in the meantime, there's no reason why we can't get straight away started. So what I first of all like to, to, to 
hit you both with is a question regarding the Homes Act, really, and just find out how the Homes, or, or otherwise known as a, the Fitness for Human Habitation Act, will affect compliance management for social landlords, and how can technology help that in the future? So it, it's the Homes Act is, is one of those questions at the moment. It's, it's, it's a big topic. It obviously affects landlords as well as affects residents. So how... How is it affecting that, yourselves? What are you guys doing to um, not one that affects that? us up in Glasgow? It's, it's uh, an England and Wales only act. You've got the tolerable standard, of course, as well. So very similar things, really. So, yep. So you're looking at really the same type of aspect. So I, I should have opened it up to the tolerable standard as well for yourself, Alistair. Yeah, we've had the to tolerable tol 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 standards for quite a while now. So we have been working with the, the, the tolerable standards in conjunction with the Scottish Housing Quality Standard. Um, so it, it's something that since 2004 has been an ongoing issue, well, you know, not an ongoing issue, but an ongoing um, topic for us, for, for Scottish landlords. I can believe it's, it. It's, it's been on the go, it's been on the cards for a lot of years. Um, there's just been some updates done last year to the Scottish Housing Quality Standard based around uh, smoke alarms and CO alarms. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, that's a massive thing, and we'll, we'll come on to that again in a bit. I'm told the audio from, from yourself, Alistair, is a little bit too loud. I'm not sure if, if there's anything you can do just to, to, to tone that down. I'm not sure where, where the microphone's picking you up. Or maybe it's your speakers, possibly, I, I'm, I'm being told. So I've anything got speakers we can... at zero. Nope. So... No, that's, we'll we'll see how we go on. We'll, we'll see, but we'll yeah, just, I believe some people are hearing a bit of feedback uh, when you talk. So it could be coming through the speakers and the microphone. But um, so, uh, from yourself, Gavin, how how is the the Homes Act? How are you dealing with that? How is technology implementing or assisting you in, in dealing with that? Well, obviously, having been dealing with ACO for a long time now. We are a long time now. We are really interested in the new um, interested in the new um, um, let's turn my volume down. Hopefully it's up. Do you hear me? I, I can hear you absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 interested in the damp and mold monitoring systems which may become available. That's going to be a very useful tool for us, especially um in cases of disrepair and residents who um, who can, who say they have issues with uh, with mould and dampness, it certainly will give us a good understanding of the issues in the properties. And whilst we're installing the system, we have the opportunity to to extend it further. That's a good thing for us. That, absolutely. So you mentioned environmental aspects as well. So that, that there's various things. Obviously, you've got. The, the ones that, that we, we're we well known for doing, which is your, your smoking carbon monoxide, but then you've got your environmental side of things as well. So damp, condensation, mold, internal air quality, that they're, they're, they're all massive factors in the Homes Act, really. So it, it's getting technology to, to help that and, and what steps that everybody's implementing and, and trying to keep ahead of the game, really, on that one. Definitely. So, yeah, well, if, if, if no more on that point, we'll, we'll move on to the next one. So it's an interesting topic, this one is. So are we entering the era of ambulance chasing solicitors, encouraging tenants to claim against their landlord? Is the only way the landlord can defend themselves properly with potentially data gathered by sensors or, or, or other means? So I'll allow either of you to, to jump in on that one and, and, and give me your opinion. I think that I think it certainly helps. We have had case of that before where you, you, you've had tenants coming back to you with, I have got black mould and it's your responsibility. Yeah. Um, we did a study with the Glasgow School of Art about three years ago and it was around uh, smart sensors in houses. It was, it was a funded study that was done on some of the properties that we were experiencing a lot of issues with and it was new build properties. It wasn't, it wasn't old or refurbished, it was new build that were up to new standard, that was up to new insulation standards, and we were still getting masses of issues with black mould. Right. Uh, the studies that we've done with the School of Art showed that a lot of it was down to lifestyle. Uh, not opening windows, sealing up ventilators, turning off bathroom vents, turning heating up as far as it would go, and then shutting the whole house up. 
it's just then trying to get that information to the tenant in a, in a way that helps to change habits and it starts to make that environment healthier for the tenant. It's, it's not just the the fact that you've got the, the ambulance chase, it's, it's an unhealthy environment and tenants living in. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the best way of putting it really, it's totally unhealthy, so it's, it's bringing it in. It, it's, I suppose that the question regarding ambulance chasing is, is, is the system open to abuse and, and what steps you can put into place to stop that? But ultimately, as, as you've just said, it, it's about putting the right environments in there, so <laughs> those steps aren't even really an option on that score. Yeah. How about well, yourself, Gavin? Part of, we, so part of the reason we get involved with the School of Art was that the ambulance chasing lawyers coming in and telling and us that the still, houses were, were riddled with penetrating damp, etc. Yeah, I'm sure. sure. What's that? Sorry, sorry, I was letting Alistair finish. Yeah, it's... Um, I don't deal so much with the side with the tenants with the with the issues with the mold. That's more our repairs team. But it's it's certainly an issue we have with the with the damp and the mold. I don't know about the legal claims we have. I know we have disrepair claims and we have a number of those cases come every now and then. It certainly will be a benefit, as I say, as I said a moment ago, to assist us in in providing evidence to prove that the um the properties are fit for habitation and we, we are managing and dealing with the situations as they arise have you had many cases um of, of tenants or, or anybody uh, approaching you about this type of thing is, is it something that's becoming increasingly aware on your radar at all or anything like that it's certainly a conversation that we're having internally about how we manage the situation um obviously we have a number of old, older buildings within barnet and the with insulation and issues there is there is issues that we have with with damp and mould. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the, there's all sorts that when you look at the technology side of things, where potentially technology can really help when it comes to either asset management, um, the, the the record of physical maintenance. Obviously, that that's a record that can be used for for defence as well. And then, of course, there's tampering of systems, which is potentially malicious, which which we hear of. And the Mike's just given us a presentation on the gateway, and, and that can highlight often when a, a, a um, tenant is tampering with the system, maybe removing alarm heads, um, taking the mains power off different devices. So there's, there's other elements potentially where technology might be able to assist on that. Uh, are these areas that you're already using? Yeah, well, we use your ACO system already and your, your portal. And... Uh it's a fantastic system for our, allowing us to monitor what's going on within inside our residents' properties. We we have a number of properties where access is an issue, so that's, this allows us to to monitor, monitor, monitor and control the issues we have. So, for example, just with the testing, the week, the monthly testing, we can monitor whether it's been tested by the residents. We can then talk to the residents and explain about the testing and the importance of the testing. And it gives us that opportunity to to get in that resident engagement with them. Yeah, no, completely agree. Thank you. Okay, so moving on, next next question really is with legislative. Well, this is very much um, to yourself, Alistair. Really, with you mentioned it earlier, the legislative changes coming into force in Scotland. How has the use of technology played a part in the challenge of future proofing your housing stock for the years to come? And, and where do you see this technology progressing to in the future? to meet the demands as legislation potentially continues to evolve. So quite a lengthy point there, but, but yeah, essentially that the, there's increased legislation and, and how are you looking to address that and potentially using technology on that? Well, like Gavin, we're already starting to fit the, the gateway systems, which is it's given us a good foot in the door. It's, it's allowing us to see things that we, we never expected when we started. Uh, it's highlighting areas of fuel poverty. It was one of the first things that we noticed when we fitted the gateway. Um, but moving on, as as that technology increases, things like the air quality monitoring, monitoring, and and hopefully the education of the of the resident is, is going to be the big thing. If we can educate the residents that we need to get in to do these compliance checks, and we can allow them access to see some of the technology that's there and some of the reporting that, that we get that we see and how that impacts on them is going to be a lot easier um, with the, the, the home linker looking at the app for the tenant to allow them to, to look at their own you know all their own equipment 
and see, see what's going on in their houses, see the state of their houses, see, see the state of their quality. It will make things easier for both the landlord and, and better for the tenant. So I, I think the technology is it's going to be a good thing going forward. It's how much data is getting collected. It's probably going to open up the question how that data is used and who gets access, access to it. Uh, I think we'll start to see a lot of people uh, complaining on, on you know an, an infringement of of the privacy, um, and I think that's something that's going to have to manage quite quite carefully. Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree with you, and I, and I could jump in on a few of those points, but before I do, I'd uh, yeah, like like to get uh, Gavin's um, thoughts on that question, really. Um, really. Um, well, I guess for, yes, for somebody who deals with the day-to-day -day installations and managing the teams that install them and the, the, the maintenance programs, I guess the the end game for us is to have the self-testing smoke detectors. That's where we'd love the technology to go. So we do reduce the, the requirement to get into the properties. That would be the, the ultimate, really. But again the technology now is fantastic in in the options it, it gives us with the residents as we you touched on early one in your presentation the co monitoring has been a a revelation for us really it's um i think that we've probably saved two or three lives already in the in the space of the, the short time that we've used the new system because the, the alert comes up before the residents are aware aware of the situation and we've had cadent attend and and in one instance, they found a gas level higher than I'd ever seen before in somebody's property, which is a huge benefit to us. As Alistair was saying, the, the data collection is a challenge, but we're we're trying to manage the data so it's relevant for the relevant departments and, and it, it will be used. I think in the short term for us, the management of the data will be our uh, maintenance contractor will manage and take the data and inform us of the faults and the situations and we'll deal with it that way to start with. Yeah, absolutely. What well, it, it's an interesting one. We're obviously very conscious of the fact that that data is having more of a, a big play and, and with having more data, there's lots of benefits that can bring, but, but equally, as, as Alice has highlighted, there could be a concern from the residents of, of how much information is being gathered on them. And I think that's a reasonable concern. So it's something that I know HomeLink have done a lot of research with and continue to, to do ongoing research with universities on that point, really. But equally, from what's been found out so far and from feedback is that residents want to be, if they see how this information is actually assisting their lives, so if you're engaging with them and they're able to physically see that, how their actions potentially could be endangering their, their health, um, then absolutely that they can often see the benefits of that really. When it comes to the ownership of the data, that, that's very much down to the client really, and, and obviously we've got very strict GDPR rules in the UK that, that govern that, that where that how that data can be stored and who's got access to it but Gavin you mentioned another one about um, CO alarms already saving lives well that, that's a really interesting topic because fires are very obvious visible risk that people can see but but when you're talking about carbon monoxide it, 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 it's invisible uh, we're not necessarily aware of it we don't think that um, the numbers that we have of how many carbon monoxide poisoning incidents we have in the UK are, are accurate figures we, we generally don't know. We, it's only a, a snapshot of potentially what's going out there. So I think, as you said, how long have, have you been monitoring this now, the carbon monoxide? Yeah, so I've, obviously we're, 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 we're at the early stages of the installation. I think we're up to around a thousand properties now. So, so yeah, I think it's been over sort of six to eight months with the new system. So yeah, it's 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 good that the, the numbers are not high, which is positive with the, the CO, but uh, the ones we have, they're serious, but yeah, it's it's a it's a very useful tool. And the other, the other, the useful aspect of the the database is with the non-access with the yearly testing. The regulations do have some wording in there. If you can't get access for a significant reason, then potentially the the portal is a a way of providing compliance reporting. Um, Obviously, for most organisations, 100% compliance is, is the way we go. Um, but as we all know, it's very difficult to get into every property. So, so that is a, a massive tool for us as well. Yeah, I can believe it. Access continues to be a, a massive issue that's constantly reported back as being one of the major challenges with compliance. Do, do, do you find the same, Alistair? 
Yeah. Yeah, it'll be in exactly the same. It's, it's, it's high access is always a big issue. You, you, I think that's. Uh, how, Sorry. On the carbon monoxide side of things as well, are you or is that something that, that you guys are doing as well in your organisation? You um, yeah. monitoring? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. We're fit, yeah, the, the carbon monoxides are going to be a standard, have been for a few years. Um, initially, we used the ACO ones along with the app if we had an activation, but now the gateway systems are getting rolled out and getting fitted, um, which has given us far more data and, and far faster. Yeah, this is it. I, I think there's a lot of, certainly carbon monoxide is one area where the, the increased data is going to be given is increased information on how quite how much of an issue it is and give us more insight on how to deal with it. But but then when we talk about the other internal uh, sensors for air quality, for damp, humidity, mold, all the rest of it, it will give you a bit of insight over quite what, what degree uh, the problem might be out there. And some of this information is currently unknown, I, I dare say, really. So, yeah. Well, we've, we've already talked about CO and the, un, 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 uh, the unseen risk that goes along with that. If we move on, with the ongoing pandemic situation, where do you see technology benefiting you around access issues and the need for you to still achieve compliance? So you mentioned a few moments ago, Gavin, that, that part six does have a, a reference and acknowledgement of the fact that if access is difficult or denied, some systems can be remotely monitored and you can get information of it via data systems, via remote data systems. So is this something that, that you're increasingly using and, and, and relying upon? Um, we still, we still obviously do our, our maintenance as part of our routine uh, gas inspections. Obviously, we do have a program for the non-gas properties in, in Barnet. We do have around a thousand properties which don't have um, gas installed as as the first source of uh, energy. So, all of them properties now have the new remote smart link system in there, so we can monitor those in case we can't get access so we do have live data on all of those in our approach they they were the first properties we felt would be the most benefit to us because we don't have an active maintenance program in those properties so so that was a good um a good option for us absolutely and how about yourself alistair um, we, we've we've been very much the same as gavin um, it's been it's been good. The gateway system we find to be really really good in attaining those levels of compliance. Being able to actually see what's going on in the flats has been has been excellent. Um, we are in early stages at this, and we're still at the rollout. Next, for, as from April, our rollout should be a lot greater than it has been. A lot of that's going to come down to this, the you know the the lockdowns in Scotland, which have been fairly strict. And, and for the last few weeks have been down to um, life and limb emergency, basically. So a lot of a lot of what we wanted to do, we've not been able to do. Um, a lot of that's coming down to some of the, the interpretation, really, of, of the lockdown rules and also tenants. Trying to get tenants to allow us in over the last few months has been absolute murder. Um, the area that we have has got a high, I think, minority portion and especially in Scotland, it seems to be a very, very insular community and the, a lot of people believe in what they're reading on Facebook. People don't let you into the house. It's, and it's been a, a real issue. I'm quite sure that's an issue that's up and down the country just now. Yeah. Yeah, I think remote monitoring and being able to get access without physically having to enter the property is a massive thing. I know when it comes to smoke alarms, ideally, we want the, the tenants to be testing them. That's what the standards say. They should be testing the smoke alarms monthly. I, I'm sure all of our tenants are testing them monthly. Um, but, but, but at least when you've got that, that way of being able to see, we can see tenants who aren't testing them. Alongside other potential sensors, you can see the tenants who are potentially more vulnerable. Uh, you mentioned earlier about fuel poverty and, and, and various other risk factors that, that could increase a tenant's vulnerability. So if you can potentially see that, it means you can hopefully focus your attention on those who, who are uh, more at risk and, and might need that assistance, really. So it's interesting to be able to see that. I know when it comes to physically testing it, equally with a smoke alarm, you want to be able to hear that sound. So, so it's great being able to check that the alarms are functioning themselves, but, but again, 
being able to encourage that tenant to test it, I, th I think is, is key. And, and again, we, we spoke about this a few times earlier, but I think tenant engagement and, and being able to get the tenant on board with the additional support that, that, that IoT, the connected home, this additional data can give them, I think that's gonna play a key role in, in getting, getting them on board really on that. Yeah, we, we've been working very hard with ACO, as you see in the video earlier on, in regards to um, the resident engagement, and that's a key for us in building the safer future. It's it's all around resident engagement, and we want the residents to be part of our um, plan going forward, and we want them to be working with us, not against us. We want we want them to understand the reasons why we're we're doing what we're doing, and 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 ultimately we're doing it for their safety, and that's what all of this is about it's about the resident safety if we can prevent one fire we've we've done something successful and if we can can monitor and 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 control and understand what's going on behind closed doors in regards to tampering with detectors and and cooking methods we we have a number of sheltered housing blocks and some of our elderly residents they're, they're still fans of the uh, the hot oil and the frying pan uh, cooking method for the sausages and bacon which in itself is very nice but it does it does cause a number of issues with detection so with all of these systems in place we can monitor talk to those residents we can we engage with the local fire brigade and have presentations not so much during the lockdown with the residents understanding the cooking methods and it, it's all all this information is great to help us to help our residents Absolutely, yeah. I think it's playing a key role in, in education, really. I think you, you hit, the, hit the nail on the head with, with that one. Um, any more on that one yourself, Alistair? No, I think I would echo what Gavin said. It's, it's, a lot of it's going to come down to education of tenants and, and that engagement with everyone. It's, and that, that at times is, is difficult. It, it depends how well your residents are to engage with you. Um, if, if you can get over that hurdle and get people to start talking to you, it makes life an awful lot easier to, to get that understanding out there of what's going on. Yeah. I think that's in multiple levels, that, that feeds into what we're trying to do here. So, yes, it, it, it's protecting tenants. It's making sure that they're safe. Um, but it's also educating them to know what steps we're putting into place to make sure that they know that we're safe. It's also making sure that they know what steps they can do as well so yes they're on board with the technology more and but equally they're on board with the more understanding of some of the risk factors that that can impact them really so i think education and engagement is is key and that's something that we're hearing we're hearing through all the research that we're doing into, into the data gathering and and people's opinions on that so it, it's it's good to know that that you guys are hearing the same really before we go for questions because i think we've got a few more minutes really so um i think we kind of have covered Everything else. So, would any of you like to say a bit of a summary on this before we do start opening up to questions from the audience? And don't worry if 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 not, if if we've covered everything already in the discussion, that's absolutely fine. But just any closing remarks from yourselves before we go to any questions? Well, I I, I, I think I'd like to say that this this the system itself and the implementation of it has been has been really successful in Barnet. To be honest, we haven't had the same challenges as such with Alistair. We started our uh, LD2 program, pardon the, the name of the uh, the program, but we, we started that in April last year at the start of the pandemic and we've now installed, managed to get in over seven, eight hundred properties in, in the interim period, even during the lockdown. Our residents have been, been fantastic. The challenge has been around getting into every room in the property and managing that safely. It has involved some moon suits and, and different... Uh, ideas of cleaning processes but we have achieved it and it, it's gone really well to be honest and we're we're really pleased with the product we're we're working with the other partners in in the organization to work and understand how that data is going to benefit everybody when we talked about the the damp and the mold and the air quality monitors there was a lot of ears pricked up in the organization and as well that's a fantastic tool for us with uh this repair cases so and we have tried to engage the whole organisation in this to let everybody else see the benefits of, of what this offers us as an organisation. That's great. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, I, we mentioned it earlier, but legislation's not 
uh, reducing in any way. It's only get increasing. So we've seen that in Scotland. There's a recent government consultation here in, in England as well to increasing certainly regarding carbon monoxide and, and echoing some of the private standards. So it, it's just increasing. So being able to, to roll this out and, and see the benefits straight away is, is, is great to hear, really. How about yourself, Alistair? Anything to, to add on that before we open up? Open up. I think I think we're echoing what, what Gavin just said there. Um, no, that's fine. That's brilliant. No, no problem at all. So this is where I'd like to open up to a few questions we've had in from the audience. So just bear with me a moment and um, see what we've had in. So should compliance be the benchmark for resident safety? So. Interesting one there. Now, I don't work in compliance, so I'm very much opening these up to, 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 to you guys to answer. I'm both probably waiting for the other party to, to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I'm going to push it to you first, Gavin. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough question, really. Um, it's not just compliance, it's for resident safety. It's... Um, it, it, it's about the whole the whole package it's not just the compliance it's the it, it's i guess compliance is is, an, is the important part of resident safety i'm not really sure, really sure how to answer this question on the spot to be fair i, I totally understand that no it's fine I, I think it is a tricky question to answer um do, do you have any any thoughts on this yourself alistair, yourself, alistair? Yeah, so I, I was I was looking at that one thinking that's that is a tricky one. I think it's going to have to be the, the kind of minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Compliance has got to be the minimum to achieve for resident safety and, and that's got to be built upon. Like like Gavin said, it's it's not it's not only compliance, there's a whole load of other stuff goes with it. Yeah, it's part of the building blocks, isn't it? It's part of the foundation, but that they work closely together really. They're both there to achieve the same outcome, but but yeah, they're, they're part of many different elements. So I think that's an important one. Another question we've had, does, does having, sorry, my eyes, I'll read the screen. Does having the smart link technology increase resource demands on the organization, possibly due to false activations or, or having some more um, to monitor in the portal time? Does that make, make sense? So yeah, I could, I'll open this up to yourself first, Alistair. We, we kind of wondered on that when we started to fit them. Um, very quickly we realized though that it reduced some of some of the resource demands false activations were something we were getting on co alarms uh, and we were getting constant call outs between scottish gas network contractors out of ours calls to contractors one property we had over the course of three weeks something like six emergency call outs for a co alarm activation so we fitted the gateway and that was brought down to tenant was in fuel poverty and the alarm was beeping when it switched over to battery backup. We, we, we killed six emergency calls plus SGN checking the, a full tenement block. We, we stopped that overnight with the gateway. Yeah. So that there was a massive saving there for us straight away. Yeah. So I suppose and we that was one of the first installs that we did. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think we're the same. It's obviously very new for us, and we're we're monitoring the systems but we haven't had not anybody from my team or anybody in the organization has currently said that the demands that this is ridiculous we can't can't cope with the demands with it as alistair was saying with the new system it seems to have calmed down the uh the false alarms and the false activations rather than made things worse yeah, I think that 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 they're good comments, and it's good to hear you both saying that. There, that's echoing the, the feedback that we're hearing on the whole. Um, so, granted, we, we're we're hearing feedback that potentially new policies, new processes need to be put into place now. This additional information is coming in, just so we can deal with that effectively. But but that it is focusing maintenance where it's needed most, and actually reducing resource really. So, it, it's good to hear that you're finding the, the same really on that one. We've had another question put by Dave Ford. Could a clause be added into the tenancy agreement on data collection for this technology? Not being an expert on um, on, on law, I'm, I'm, I'm unsure, but I'm, 
I, I assume that the, the the information we give to the residents so that there's potential for disclaimers and um, forms to, to sign for the information. I guess with all of this information, is it if it, it's to help them? I don't. It, it depends how you use the information, and I guess that's how we need to get across. If we 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 wouldn't be in the process of. Um, installing a mold alarm and then telling everybody that Mrs. Smith at uh, Block X is uh, is in fuel poverty. That's not what we're lo looking to do with our information, but but certainly we will have the legal side be looking at the data collection and to how we manage that and how we get that across to the residents. But we already monitor our emergency lighting, our door entry systems in Barnet as well. So we've only had one or two people ever raise concerns over data protection and again with with them systems we resolved those issues quite quickly because it wasn't personal information the data we was collecting yeah yeah it makes sense how about yourself alistair yeah i was, I was probably going to say something along the same lines but it's not personal information you're collecting it shouldn't be subject to gdpr no, this, this is the thing. So it, at the moment, when it comes to if you're just collecting information regarding a smoke alarm, you're not actually collecting any personally identifiable information at that level. When you open that up, though, to potentially when it does include names or, or if it includes other information, then that kind of fingerprint can um, go over that, that border where you would need to get um, where, where the tenant potentially would need to, to, to buy into that and make sure they're okay. And I think that goes back to the point where we said earlier, education, uh, engagements, uh, so they can make an informed decision. Actually, I am quite happy for this information to be gathered. It may not necessarily be about me as a person, about what the property that I live in, because my health has directly benefited from it. So I, I think that they all kind of tie in, but you're absolutely right. At the moment, the data is not capturing, or certainly when talking about SmartLink and, and the the presentation that Mike gave earlier, that's non-personally identifiable information. But as we move further and further, the way that IoT connected home is going, I, I think this is a type of question that's going to be asked more. Who owns the data? Who can access it? Uh, what you do with that data? Can I have access to it? And, and, and obviously signing up to, to, to know what they're getting as a benefit from that. I think that's, that's vital, really, going back to that engagement and education point. Well, I think that's pretty much wrapped up most of the questions we've had in from the audience. So a massive thank you to yourself, Gavin, and Alistair for joining us this afternoon. Um, I say the panel was meant to be twice as big again, so thank you both for stepping up. There's been more <laughs> pressure put on you both, and I really appreciate you uh, jumping in and, um, and answering the questions as you have. It's been really, really good. And to everybody else, we are going to be continuing the conversation on. There's going to be an additional four breakout rooms opened up after this session finishes. So I urge you to please jump in those, carry on the conversations. The audience will be a part of them. There'll be various different uh, ACO members of staff in there. So, yeah, please, thank you very much for joining us today. Please carry on the conversation. And uh, it's been a pleasure. All the best. <laughs>